I've broken this video down into 12 common claims I've heard people make about how Christianity can save and or preserve Western civilization. Now, all of these views have been expressed in the video called Rediscovering Faith, My Journey Back to Christianity by a guy named Dave on the popular channel known as Computing Forever. So, let's go through the claims one by one and see if they're supported by facts or feelings, shall we? Claim number one. The world is in decline, we're less safe, so we need a solution, and our values were in a better place 50 years ago. The first step in selling Christian nationalism as a cure is to convince people that there's a disease. Due to the commodification of bad news, it's rather easy to convince people that the world is in decline. Uh, the old saying, if it bleeds, it leads, is no longer just a rule for mainstream news, uh, but for everybody who wants clicks on their blog uh, or views on their videos. Now, since flooding both mainstream and social media with fear and sensationalism is a solid business model, uh, the world is made to seem like it's in the middle of an apocalypse. But that is simply not true. Poverty is the lowest it has ever been. Likewise, violent crime, including murder, has declined dramatically in most of the first world. We are currently living in the most prosperous, advanced, leisurely time in human history. So, as these people try to sell you the great decline, and who's responsible, of course, uh, it's actually the opposite of what they say. There's an inverse correlation. As violence and poverty have gone down, the non-religious have gone up. What's also interesting to note is that public perception of the crime rate is at odds with the data. People think things are getting worse while they're getting better, and that data, I believe, is directly related to the data that shows how religious people believe the rise in the non-religious is having a negative effect in American society. In other words, the slander against us is working. Uh, similar reactions reflect these inverse correlations when we see, for instance, people complaining about violent video games, when in fact violence has gone down as video game popularity exploded. Uh, or they blame porn for rape, but as rape has declined, porn has increased. They see the opposite of reality because uh, human beings are naturally more impressed by anecdotes than the hard numbers that tell what's really going on. Uh, now, I don't want to oversell our condition uh, because there are certainly problems uh, we need to solve. But what's most important to take away from what I'm saying is that we definitely do not want to go back to where we were in the past. What's interesting to note is that throughout every era there were those who believed that the previous eras were superior. Um, the quote, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory is a quote that has been repeated in one form or another regularly throughout the 20th century at least as far back as May of 1913. So there were people in 1913 wanting to go back to the good old days. It seems we will always suffer people with these mistaken beliefs about the past. In Dave's video, he laments that the values we had 50 years ago have been stripped from us. When people see the present as being worse than it really is, a natural consequence of that is that many people also see the past as better than it really was, looking at the good while ignoring the bad, which is easier to do for those of us who would have had less to worry about back then or who weren't even alive back then. So. Were our values really that much better 50 years ago, around 1969? Well, being openly racist was much more socially acceptable back then. Black people had to endure violence and injustice as they fought tooth and nail for basic equal treatment under the law, let alone fight for basic 
social equality, uh, gay people were also widely discriminated against, castigated, and had to stay in the closet, much more so than today. Uh, some aspects of their lifestyles were also technically illegal, and forget about marriage. Uh, while atheists have always been vilified, it was much worse back then, so they largely stayed in the closet too. Uh, in Dave's own country of Ireland, the Catholics and Protestants were in a conflict that resulted in riots, murder, and terrorism. The United States was involved in a war that cost the lives of millions of people, including almost 60,000 American soldiers in only about five years, which is a number of troop casualties we would never accept today. Uh, we lost about 4,500 in Iraq. Despite all this, some people simply see it as a better time uh, because people of their demographics held more power and influence. Uh, never mind that it was a demonstrably worse, less safe, and less free time to be alive. But maybe 50 years isn't far back enough. Uh, if you go back a little more, though, you're dealing with a world war, um, go back more and it's a Great Depression. Uh, go back more and it's another world war. Uh, it's disease. It's slavery. It's deadlier wars. We are simply in a better time right now uh, than we ever have been. So be very wary of those who want to take us back. Claim number two, Christianity has been tried and tested for thousands of years and has been essential to building and maintaining Western civilization. Now, once you're sold the idea that there was some idyllic time of the past we should return to, almost utopian, uh, Christianity is presented as a way to get us there. Uh, yes, Christianity has been tried and tested for thousands of years, but what did the vast majority of those thousands of years look like? Uh, brutal wars, terrible pandemics, authoritarian oppression, lower life expectancy, high infant mortality, slavery, child labor, exploitation, etc. Now, while Christianity was a part of some of these things, I'm not even saying, I'm not even blaming uh, Christianity for them because such problems existed in places where Christianity did not hold sway. What we don't see, however, uh, is Christianity putting a stop to these problems. Uh, things like the revival of classical antiquity, the Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution uh, had much more to do with the rise of modern Western civilization than Christianity, which isn't even Western. Uh, Christianity came from the Near East. The irony of selling Christianity as a way to uh, save us from the most prosperous era that has ever existed uh, is that not until we started moving away from religious thinking did the world dramatically improve. Uh, Christianity is 2,000 years old, but all too often people only want to give it credit for the last couple hundred years, uh, the precise time it started losing influence, while ignoring the 1,500 or so years it was hegemonic throughout centuries that none of us would actually realistically uh, want to return to. What about today, though? Uh, of the top 10 countries with the highest crime rates, eight of them have Christian supermajorities. The other two are Islamic and at war. Uh, if you look at the opposite end of the spectrum, of the countries with the lowest crime rates, only two have Christian supermajorities. Most are largely secular with a low regard for the importance of religion, and three have majority Muslim populations. Estonia is the least religious place on earth with only 16% of their population believing in a god and has the 11th lowest crime rate in the entire world and is ranked 16th in the World Bank Business Index. Incidentally, the top country in the business index is New Zealand, followed by Singapore, Denmark, and Hong Kong, not exactly bastions of Christianity. These are the top 32 countries with the highest homicide rates, 28 
of them have Christian supermajorities. And not only that, but they have a high regard for the importance of religion. Compare that with the bottom of the homicide list. If you look up the countries with the lowest murder rates, you'll find a lot of the same countries can be found with the highest levels of the non-religious and with the lowest regard for the importance of religion for a peaceful life in today's world simply follow the atheists claim number three religion and science are not in conflict now this is a claim that some religious people make because they ignore their brethren while some people don't let their religious beliefs conflict with science, the fact remains that a great many others do. Uh, creationists have tried time and time again to usurp evolution in the classroom and replace it with creationism. At times, they've tried to compromise and teach the controversy, uh, i.e. the literal conflict between their religious beliefs and science. Some deny climate science for religious reasons. Some deny the Big Bang for religious reasons. Some deny uh, that the universe is billions of years old, uh, or even believe that the Earth is only a few thousand years old. And since politicians have a nasty habit of pandering to the religious, uh, or even of being creationists themselves, these beliefs can actually retard scientific progress. So, no, you can't say that religion and science are not in conflict because you are not the spokesperson for all religious people. Claim number four, religion is a way of preventing tyranny by putting certain human rights out of the reach of humans so that they cannot be interfered with. This is the part where dogma is treated like it's actually a good thing. And now, at first, it may seem like a good idea to put rights beyond our reach so that they cannot be affected. The problem with not being able to make such amendments, however, is that not everyone has a good idea about what should or should not be a right. Uh, people once considered it their right to own slaves. Uh, people once considered it a right uh, to be able to beat their wives and children or for a man to have sex with his wife whenever he wanted, regardless of what she wanted. Now, what if we put those rights out of our reach so that we could not change them? Uh, what you're really advocating here is a, is a way to stop human betterment. Uh, you're not arguing for protection from tyranny. You're arguing for the protection of tyranny. Claim number five, nations that lose religion tend to collapse. Now, this is an extremely misleading statement. First of all, religion has been ubiquitous throughout history. And the non-religious have been very rare historically and therefore cannot be scapegoated as the cause of collapse. Correlation is not causation. Religion and atheism naturally fluctuate with prosperity. Uh, typically, as a nation becomes more successful, it tends to lose religion. And as a nation declines, it tends to gain religion. If we just step back and stop blaming each other, uh, and look objectively at why this phenomenon occurs, I think we can all find agreement here. Religious people will often tell you, as Dave does in his video, that religion gives people hope. And I agree, but I actually just think it's false hope. Regardless, false hope has the same behavioral effect as justified hope. Uh, thus, religion will not thrive where people do not need hope, such as places where there is prosperity. Conversely, where life is difficult and dangerous, people will seek hope where they can, and thus they will turn to religion, uh, thereby causing religion to thrive. Uh, this is why the first world is becoming less religious, while the third world remains highly religious. If a prosperous, modern, first world nation collapsed, you'd naturally see low levels of religion before the collapse. Then, after the collapse, you'd see a religious revival as a natural reaction. And if there's a recovery, uh, it would occur during the religious revival. A false narrative 
uh, could thus be crafted around such a pattern that it was the fault of lacking religion, uh, when in fact the lack of religion is merely a side effect of success and the revival of religion a side effect of failure. Uh, in other words, such a narrative conflates correlation with causation. There's much more to it than that, though. In a societal decline, uh, not only do people turn to religion for hope, uh, but fewer people are getting educations, so they turn to religion for answers. Uh, they're not getting medical treatment, so they turn to prayer. Their mortality rates increase, so they turn to religion to cope with their grief. Uh, they no longer have the means uh, for socialization and entertainment in a capitalist environment like restaurants, movie theaters, and shopping centers, so they turn to communal places like church. Uh, when people are losing their religion, it's because their needs and wants are being met, which is a good thing. Having many atheists in your society is a good sign. You can blindly pick a nice place to live knowing only if there's a high non-religious population there. Uh, this would lead you to places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Northern Europe, and increasingly the United States. Uh, on the other hand, many places with the highest Christian populations, those in the 90th percentile and above, are statistically the most violent countries. Uh, you know, Venezuela, Honduras, Uganda, Brazil, the Congo, Colombia, Mexico, Rwanda, Ecuador, Haiti. And no, I'm not saying that's the fault of Christianity. Uh, those places have their own geopolitical issues, uh, some a direct consequence of our policies. Uh, but what I am saying is that Christianity clearly failed to save their nations. Uh, if it were true that Christianity is a significant factor in a nation's success, then the simple fact is that the third world should have surpassed the first world a long time ago. Claim number six, removing God makes people vulnerable to people trying to become God and causes people to rely upon the state. Religion does not fix this problem, and in fact, it makes it worse. Uh, one thing atheists and theists have in common is that we both believe that a whole lot of religions are wrong. The theists uh, just believe that one religion, their religion, uh, happens to be the correct one. So from where did all these false religions come? Uh, they didn't come from God, so uh, they must have come from other human beings. We can all at least agree upon that much, right? Uh, this clearly shows us that the belief in God does not stop people from trying to become God uh, by presenting their own ideas, uh, beliefs, and preferences as the desires of God, thereby lending their views undeserved authority. That would simply not be possible in a nation of non-believers. Yet, it is still very possible in a nation of believers. They have that vulnerability that we do not. And politicians and other such authoritarians have preyed upon that vulnerability. Far from being a safeguard against the state, uh, religion is often used as a tool of the state. Furthermore, and forgive me for going on a little bit of a tangent here, but this disdain for uh, relying on the state, for the most part, is a bell that will not be unrung for broader society. Uh, we as human beings have changed so radically uh, that not just the state, but society in general has become integral to our survival. Uh, most people uh, rely upon it whether they believe in a god or not. Or whether they whether they collect welfare or not, uh, take an average first world person and drop them into the middle of a deep wilderness, weeks away from civilization, and then take a human being from twenty thousand years ago and do the same. Which one of them is more likely to survive? Uh, the modern person is less likely to survive because billions of people have become reliant on the complex uh, system of infrastructure we have developed, which is coordinated around the world, uncontrolled by any one person. And if something catastrophic happens to that system, uh, millions of people will die. 
reliance on that system is not because of any sort of conspiracy. It's the result of human nature uh, because people have always looked for ways to make life easier, which we have done through planning, agriculture, division of labor, and automation. We now shape the world to service us rather than the hunter-gatherer way of coping with nature to survive. We live the solutions to the problems of which we are not even aware. Uh, the cost of our comfort is that a collapse would force us to relearn the basics. People who do not organize are at the mercy of those who do. So we will always organize. Uh, through such organization, the influence of a state is almost certainly inevitable in one form or another, for better or worse. Claim number seven, Christianity values the family and gender roles. This is something that seems innocuous, but it's actually the type of stuff that dystopias are made out of. Uh, it seems harmless because we're used to it, but that's a fallacy of tradition. Something isn't right uh, just because people have gotten away with it for a long time. Now, I can completely understand if you want to choose to follow traditional gender roles for yourself, if that is what you wish to do of your own volition. Uh, that's fine. You should be free to do so. And most people will do so because Christianity does not own the family unit, which is naturally occurring and far more ancient than the religion itself. There will be people, however, who do not desire to adhere to that template. To vilify them is wrong. To try to control the destiny of others, to consign them to a specific role in society based upon the way they were born is tyrannical and authoritarian. If you are using your religion as an excuse to enact such control, then it is yet another way religion is being used as a vehicle for tyranny and oppression. Again, we see that it is the presence of religion and not the absence of it that makes us vulnerable to authoritarianism. Claim number eight is quite a doozy and it conflates religion and politics, but we're going to roll with it. Leftists, it says, leftists have subverted the West by promoting temptation, sin, greed, consumerism, pornography, sex, instant gratification, hedonism, drugs, and the obsession with materialism, individual rights, and individualism described as an attack on Christianity. This corruption destroys the nation state with unplanned pregnancy, broken homes, low parental investment, and alternative lifestyles. Selling vice as a form of liberation is actually enslavement, making us easier for governments to control. This is one of the more bizarre aspects of his video and of similarly minded thinkers. These people typically associate communism with the left and capitalism with the right, which is understandable even if not an absolute rule. Uh, strangely though, he associates consumerism, materialism, sex, hedonism, instant gratification, individualism, etc. with communism rather than capitalism, but such things have been most widely and vociferously promoted by capitalism, not communism. Uh, sex, hedonism, and instant gratification are very profitable and therefore present in a capitalist economy. Uh, individualism is certainly not the focus of communism. It shares the very root of the word community, which is what you want religion to provide. Uh, it's about collectivism. Though it would seem they'd have you believe otherwise, religious people care very much about identity politics and can very easily be offended to the point of wanting widespread censorship, boycotts and firings, etc., i.e. cancel culture. Uh, it's just that they have very different sacred cows. Let's also address his claims about unplanned pregnancy, broken homes, low parental investment, and alternative lifestyles. Uh, in my country of the United States, these are the top 
five states with the highest teen pregnancy rate. Four out of five of them are red states, and they average 78.6% Christian, which is above the national average, with many advocating abstinence only rather than sexual education. That is an example of the religious denial of human nature. Um, these are the top five states with the lowest teen pregnancy rate, all blue states, and they average 61.6% Christian, far below the national average. Yet again, we see that the facts are the opposite of what the Christian moralizers claim. Birth rates are also much higher in more religious areas, especially in the third world. Interestingly, though, the vast majority of abortions are actually given to Catholics and Protestants. 68.7% of people getting abortions are Christian. 23.7% have no religious affiliation. Dave worries about abortion rates in the Western world, but 78% of all abortions are obtained in developing countries. 91% of divorced people believe in God. 3% don't know what they believe. Only 6% are atheist. Christianity is not protecting the traditional family unit. Furthermore, having a dogmatic view of the family unit, that they should only look a certain way, will marginalize a lot of people who you describe as having alternative lifestyles. And that is an unjust authoritarian imposition and particularly hypocritical uh, seeing as how according to the stats the religious folks can't even manage to abide by their own standards uh, why do you want the rest of the world to resemble you anyway uh, don't you see how boring that would be also consider what happens to those who have shitty families. There should be fail-safes for that in society so that people don't have to rely on their families because not all nuclear families are good and healthy. Claim number nine, the left encourages guilt and self-hatred from which no solid foundation can be built. This is another bizarre reversal. Uh, guilt and self-hatred is precisely what Christianity has always promoted. Uh, you have to believe that you are broken and thus need the religion. Another popular conservative Christian on YouTube named Ali Beth Stuckey said in one of her videos, complete with a dozen Bible verses to support her statement that, quote, we are not just bad people, but we are condemned. We are dead in our sin. We are corrupted. We are polluted. We are desperately wicked, whether we feel like it or not. We are completely lost. We are completely incapable of cleaning ourselves up or making ourselves presentable to God. This means that in order to be saved, we need grace. We have to have it. See, this is a standard Christian belief. If there are people on the left who want to make sure that certain injustices of the past are not repeated, that is not the same as making people believe that they are broken. Sure, maybe there are some people who uh, can end up being counterproductive in their attempts to help, and no shortage of those on the other side who want to highlight them as the norm uh, rather than an outlier. But in Christianity, it's actual dogma that we are born guilty and broken. Claim number 10, uh, spreading Christianity is an act of defiance against globalism. Uh, no, it's a form of globalism. Now, some people think globalism is a Jewish conspiracy, uh, but if you simply see it as a form of worldwide homogeneity, uh, then getting everyone to think and believe the same thing is exactly what globalism is. That is what Christianity has promoted. Uh, what is more global than Christianity? Furthermore, has the global spread of Christianity worked? No. As we can see, the third world has a much higher percentage of Christians, and they are not in a better place because of it. In fact, we often see them trying to escape 
to less religious places, uh, which brings me to the next claim, claim number 11, losing religion causes a nation to become vulnerable to immigration. Conservative Poland will survive because it has Christian values, a strong sense of their identity, and a desire to maintain strong borders. Uh, many Christians are not doing well. There's a few countries doing well that have a high Christian percentage, sure, but most Christian supermajority countries are not doing well. Uh, Poland is often cherry-picked as an example, uh, but even if we consider Poland, there are problems. Uh, their Christian values, strong sense of identity, and a desire to maintain strong borders did not save them from another country with Christian values, a strong sense of identity, and a desire to maintain strong borders, which was Nazi Germany, a state that was 90% Christian, and Nazis rose to power among them using rhetoric against degeneracy and hedonism, and they came with promises to destroy or drive out those who were allegedly subverting their culture and country. That's why people draw parallels to Nazism today. When you express the exact same rhetoric, uh, it scares them, understandably, uh, because the Nazis did not just come out of the gate killing people. It was a slow boil that started with such rhetoric and ended with genocide. When Dave describes us, as he does in his video, as a sick part of the body that will negatively affect the rest of the body, that's the kind of vilification that people will use to justify atrocities against us. Now, I'm not saying that that's what his intent is, uh, but his intent doesn't matter much if the consequences are the same. And there's one more very important point to make here. Religion is often used as a convenient excuse regarding immigration when the religion of the immigrants don't match. For instance, if they're Muslims rather than Christians. But consider immigration concerns in the United States, however, where Religion cannot be used as an excuse. Most of our migrants come from Mexico, Central, and South America. <clears throat> Those migrants are Christians coming from lands that have Christian supermajorities. Yet, despite that, conservative Christian Americans still don't want them here. Uh, if everyone on earth were Christian, I have the suspicion that Dave would still care very much about immigration. Consider what would happen if Dave's home country of Ireland imported all of its immigrants from Uganda. Uh, Uganda is overwhelmingly Christian, complete with strong restrictions against gay people. If all the people coming into Ireland were Ugandan Christians, uh, do you think Dave would still have a problem with it? And finally, claim number 12, losing religion means we lose sacrifice, personal accountability, restraint, honor, and duty. Now, this is simply a slander against non-religious people. We are disproportionately a low percentage of the prison population. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, 80% of prisoners are Christian, which is higher than the percentage of Christian citizens, but only 0.2% are atheists, which is far lower than the percentage of atheist citizens. If you want to link sacrifice, accountability, restraint, honor, and duty to things like abortion and divorce, and I'm sure you do, uh, it's, as we've already seen, those are happening in abundance amongst Christians anyway. Uh, I know these things seem counterintuitive to many people, but that's because of the many pervasive lies that have been insidiously spread about non-believers. When you actually look at our statistics, uh, we are among the most honorable, accountable, and responsible. And that's precisely why we don't need religion. Our good and responsible behavior has lifted us up and beyond uh, the desire for the false hope that religion sells. Now, notice that Dave expressed how his views changed as he got older. Uh, 
I think that has a lot to do with it. I think he looks at the natural, boisterous behavior of the youth and draws inferences about broader society from that. But you can find older men uh, complaining about how younger generations are in decline as far back as Socrates. Uh, that's an illusion of getting older. It has always and will always be that way, uh, just by nature of what it is to be young. Uh, don't fall into that cliché trap of hating the generations that come after you, and certainly don't do what Dave seems to be doing and extrapolating from the next generation, exploring what it is to be human as the world losing its responsibility. Uh, Dave has get-off-my-lawn grumpy old man syndrome. Don't be a Dave. As far as people... Um, no longer having personal accountability, restraint, honor, and duty, religion has a very different dynamic. Uh, of course, there are plenty of religious people who have those fine traits, but religion, and Christianity in particular, offers ways around them. Uh, and there's no shortage of hypocrites to use as examples. All too often, someone can quietly ask forgiveness from God in private when they're really just talking to themselves and making themselves feel better, rather than making amends and restitution with the people of whom they've actually wronged. Uh, then they can simply repeat the process, and in fact their religion tells them that they're doomed to repeat the process. This is a way of avoiding accountability while feeling like you're being accountable. Another thing religion does is provide a handy facade for lazy judgment. People know you're a Christian, or you loudly and proudly espouse it. So many of them will naturally assume you're trustworthy and honorable when you could be anything but. This is yet another way religion is used to manipulate, lends false credibility, and makes people vulnerable to being fooled. Besides the opinions of a couple like-minded people, uh, Dave's references included nothing more than what he repeatedly referred to as, quote, what he was seeing in the world. In other words, his feelings and anecdotes, which are not reliable, especially if within a filter bubble. But he is certainly not alone in how he incorrectly perceives the broader world, which is precisely why his views are so disturbingly common. Many of their incorrect assumptions about the world, as I said earlier, are the result of the commodification of bad news, which is very ironic seeing as how they so often express distrust of the media. I, on the other hand, do not require your faith or intuition because I offer you all kinds of statistics, data, and history that explain exactly what's going on, with links to dozens of sources in the description below, while Dave offers you nothing but links to himself. So, next time you're listening to the facts over feelings, people, pay more attention to who is actually using facts to support their position and who is just using their feelings. To any conservative Christians watching, I want to leave you with this consideration. Jesus Christ himself was someone who fought against the religious conventions of his time. And if you are part of a religious majority condemning those who fight against the religious conventions of our time, how sure can you be that if you had been born during Jesus' time, as a religious conservative looking to preserve the religious conventions of your time, that you too would not be appalled at hearing the things Jesus had to say, the way he seemed to amend the texts you held sacred. The religious conservatives of his time found him so contentious that they killed him. Can you honestly say you would not have been among his detractors, promoting a maintaining of normalcy, a return to the old ways, rather than following this radical new preacher who literally encouraged men to leave their families? So that's it. Twelve common misconceptions refuted. 
Uh, I made a previous response to his video in which I actually played all 22 minutes of his video, pausing it and responding as I went. But I disagreed with so many of his statements that it ended up being two hours long. Uh, so I thought instead I would summarize my points in this video, uh, which is much better. Uh, there are still some good points made in that two-hour video, though. So if you're interested in watching it, I decided to go ahead and just post it on my alternate channel, Dark Antics. Link in the description below. Thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to my video. And uh, a huge thank you to all my patrons and subscribe star supporters who are very necessary in this age of demonetizing controversial videos, which is just about all I upload. Uh, so thank you for making it possible for me to carry on. I don't know if I could ever adequately express my appreciation. Um, I see you. I see your names. I, I read your messages. And I thank you very much. Take care, everybody.